afternoon. I'm going to start with some bad news that may or may not come as a surprise to you. As we get older, our brains become less able to change. Now, let me be more specific. During childhood, we pass through developmental periods where our brains undergo rapid change that's guided by our environment. And during these periods of, of development, information from our senses can directly influence the development of our brains. However, as we mature into adulthood, the capacity of our brains for change is reduced. And this has important implications for the ability of the adult brain to recover from the effects of damage or abnormal development. So here's the good news. As I'm going to describe today, it appears that the adult brain does in fact retain a substantial capacity for change if we can identify the right tools and techniques to unlock it. The image you can see here is of my brain taken with an MRI scanner. And today we're going to focus on the regions of our brain that are responsible for the sense of sight. And these brain areas are primarily located in the back of the brain in what we call the occipital lobes. So why are we focusing on sight? Well, a large amount of research into how the adult brain can change has focused on a disorder of vision called amblyopia. In order to recover from amblyopia, the brain has to undergo substantial change, these brain areas in particular. So let me tell you a little bit more about amblyopia. During childhood, our brain develops to learn how to use information from our eyes. It learns how to see. And as I mentioned before, information from our senses can directly influence the development of our brain. Now, some children have a difference in the images that are seen by the two eyes during this early stage of development. This difference could be due to unequal focusing power between the two eyes, meaning that the brain receives a clear image from one eye, but a chronically blurred image from the other eye. Alternatively, the two eyes might be misaligned so that the brain receives mismatched or decorrelated images from the two eyes. Now, under these conditions, the brain may develop so that information from the eye with the weaker or misaligned image is processed abnormally. That causes a loss of vision in that eye that we call amblyopia. Now, crucially, simply going back and correcting the problem that caused amblyopia does not immediately recover vision in the eye. So, for example, providing the correct pair of spectacles to give a clear image in the two eyes or surgically aligning the eyes does not immediately allow for vision to recover. And that's because the problem is no longer to do with the eye, it's to do with the way in which the brain has developed to use or process information from that eye. Recovery from amblyopia requires the brain to undergo substantial change. It effectively has to relearn how to see. Now, in children who are rapidly developing and who have highly changeable brains, it's possible to treat amblyopia by covering the good eye, and that allows the brain to relearn how to use information from the amblyopic eye. However, adult patients who have amblyopia are typically told that they are untreatable. And this is due to the prevailing view that the adult brain no longer has enough capacity for change to relearn how to use the amblyopic eye. So amblyopia then provides us with a really unique opportunity to test different tools and techniques for enabling the adult brain to change. If we can identify interventions that can recover vision in adult patients who have amblyopia, those interventions have allowed the visual areas of the brain to change substantially. And today I'm going to talk about two such interventions that I've been involved in developing along with colleagues at McGill University here at Waterloo and the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Those techniques are the use of modified video games that are designed to retrain the brain to use both eyes together and the use of techniques that allow us to stimulate the visual areas of the brain in order to make them temporarily more changeable. 
So let me begin with video games. First of all, I'll give you some background to this approach. When somebody who has amblyopia has both eyes open, typically information from the amblyopic eye is suppressed. What that means is that the amblyopic eye could be open, it's sending information through to the brain, but somewhere along that pathway, that information is blocked or suppressed from conscious awareness. So even though the person has both eyes open, they're only able to see through their good eye. Now, it is in fact possible to allow the brain to use both eyes together in amblyopia if we show clearly visible high contrast images to the amblyopic eye and different low contrast, harder to see images to the good eye. If we get that difference in contrast correct between the two eyes, it's possible to overcome suppression and allow the brain to use both eyes together. And that is the principle that underlies this video game approach. So let's take the game Tetris uh, as an example. In this example here, the blocks falling down the screen are shown at high contrast to the amblyopic eye, and the blocks at the bottom of the screen that the falling ones have to be tessellated into are shown to the good eye at a much lower contrast. We can show separate images for the two eyes using red green glasses. For the example, you see here with an iPod or a phone or a tablet. Alternatively, we can use head mounted virtual reality displays that have a separate screen for each eye. Now the contrast balancing here is, is essential because the brain has to use both eyes together to play the game. That's because neither eye on its own has enough information to play. So the way that this approach works is a particular participant would be given the game and the contrast difference between the two eyes is set so that they can play. Over time, as they successfully play, the difference between the two eyes is gradually reduced in order to train the brain how to use the two eyes together. Now, studies that have examined this approach in adult patients who have amblyopia have been really encouraging. These are studies that have been conducted in controlled laboratory environments without any distractions and where the gameplay is monitored. Now, in those situations, Adult patients have shown substantial improvements in vision in their amblyopic eye. Remember, in theory, these people should be untreatable, and yet vision has improved. Some participants have even recovered what we call stereopsis, or 3D vision, that requires the brain to use both eyes together. So really, really promising initial results with this technique. But work in this area is not yet complete. A recent clinical trial has showed that when the iPod version of Tetris that I show you here is taken home, it's no longer effective. Now, one possible reason for that is that the games were not sufficiently engaging for at use at home. And so current work in this area is looking at the development of games that might engage participants at home and allow for this technique to be more effective. Here's one example. Uh, in this situation, the mole characters are shown to the amblyopic eye at high contrast and the different types of obstacles and rewards that they interact with are shown to the good eye at a much lower contrast. Uh, the idea is that this game is much more engaging, will hold people's attention, and the hope is that with the development of these sort of techniques, this type of approach might provide a new treatment for adults who have amblyopia that works on the principle of retraining the brain to use both eyes together. So now let me describe the second technique. This is the use of methods that allow us to, <laughs> the use of methods that allow us to stimulate visual areas of the brain. This slide's got a slightly jumbled here, but in the top image is a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Now in this technique, a handheld coil is held against the head and in this situation, you can see it's being held against the visual areas of my brain at the back of my head. And a very brief magnetic field is induced within that coil. The magnetic field passes harmlessly through the skull and it induces a brief and weak electrical current in the underlying region of the brain. Now, a number of studies have shown that repeated administration of these stimulation pulses can increase activity in the stimulated brain area and at least theoretically change the neurochemistry of that area to make it temporarily more changeable. The second technique that's partially obscured here 
is the use of what's called transcranial direct current stimulation. The principle is very similar, but rather than using magnetism, two electrodes are placed on the head and a weak electrical current is run between those two electrodes. The electrical current interacts with the brain areas underneath the electrodes and has similar effects to those I've already described. The stimulated brain area becomes more active and the neurochemical environment can be changed to temporarily make that brain area more changeable. And in the image of me here, you would be able to see an electrode positioned at the back of my head over the visual areas of the brain. Now, when these techniques have been applied to adults with amblyopia, our initial results have been really encouraging. 80% of adult patients who've taken part in our studies across a series of different experiments have experienced improved vision in their amblyopic eye. Now, these improvements are temporary, lasting a matter of hours or days, but they do show that the adult brain is able to change to use information from the amblyopic eye more effectively. And so, in current studies, we're looking at whether we can make these changes longer lasting by, for example, using multiple stimulation sessions. We've also found that combining the brain stimulation with the video game actually increases the improvement in vision that's experienced by adult patients with amblyopia over and above playing the video game alone. And that suggests that these sort of interventions could be combined in order to maximize the ability of the brain to change. So I hope that I've at least partially convinced you that the adult brain does in fact retain a substantial capacity for change and techniques such as modified video games or brain stimulation can harness that capacity. Now research into these sort of techniques is not limited to visual areas of the brain. Research groups worldwide have been investigating these techniques and others like them for neurorehabilitation in adults across a wide range of different brain disorders with the hope of enabling the brain to change to allow for recovery in those patients. And as a whole, work in this area, I think really effectively demonstrates that it is in fact possible to teach an old brain new tricks. Thank you.